been several versions of Ramayanam. All of you must be aware. We have Valmiki Ramayanam, the Kamba Ramayanam, Tulsi Das Ramayanam, and Ramayanam written by Potana. There are various versions. In fact, these are only to name a few examples. There are plenty of Ramayanam. But of all this, perhaps the best and the authenticated Ramayanam is the Ramakatha Rasavahini written by Bhagawan Sri Satyasai Baba. This is just not a narration of a story or an episode. In fact, we can even say it is an autobiography of Ra Sri Rama written by Sai Rama himself. S Ramakatha Rasavahini is full of messages. Such that we need, an, we need a saptaham of this type. Not just to share the incidents and the stories and the episodes which happened in Ramayana, which all of us know. We need to dwell upon the inner significance, the takeaway messages, which will help us in leading our lives better as individuals, in family, in society, in profession. Towards that is this Ramayana Saptaham. And to share today's topic on the inner significance of Ramayanam, we have Dr. G. S. Sri Rangarajan, who is, all of you must be aware, is the faculty of the Brindavan campus. I'll just give a brief introduction. Sri Rangarajan, sir, is qualified as a BE in industrial production. He did his MBA in systems from the Sri Satasai Institute of Higher Learning, Prashanti Nilayam. Presently, he is the associate professor in this Brindavan campus. Prior to this, he had two important positions. He was, in fact, the controller of examinations in Prashanti Nilayam, as well as the warden of this very same Brindavan campus. Today, Sri Rangarajan, sir, he is going to share on the inner significance of Ramayana. Over to you, sir. Sairam. Pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet, respected members of the August gathering, respected elders, brothers, sisters, and my dear students. A loving Sai Ram to all of you and a very, very happy Sri Rama Naomi. Ramaya, Rama Bhadraya, Rama Chandraya, Vedhase, Ragunathaya, Nathaya, Sitaya, Pataye, Namaha. Invoking the blessings of our beloved Sai Rama, in the next hour or so, I would like to dwell upon some important messages from this great epic Ramayana. First of all, I have used a couple of pictures on my slide only to enhance the impact. I have taken it from various sources. I am very grateful to all these sources. Many of them I know not, but I am very grateful to these sources. My talk will be presented in three modules, three important messages from the Ramayana. The first 20 minutes is on how to choose good over bad. How do you differentiate between good and bad? And then we'll have a bhajan. Just in case we have slept, we can wake up. The second module is on the aspect of surrender. What is true surrender according to Swami? And how we can learn this from the Ramayana? Again, we'll have a bhajan after that. And then the last 20 minute module is on how to be a true instrument of Bhagwan. So with your permission, we will begin. As I said, the first module is how to choose good over bad in Bhagwan's words in Vedic scriptural parlance. It is called Shreyas over Prayas. Typically, Swami says, Shreyas is something which is inward. 
it may appear to be difficult but eventually it leads to good prayers is just the other way round appears to be initially very good but can land you in soup so when you look at this picture i hope the audience gathered here is able to see this picture is this good or is this bad for those who cannot see clearly some person is giving cash to the other person so many thoughts can come in a mind it could be good it could be bad god knows what it is same way bhagwan gives his example of a knife i took a kitchen knife so obviously it's good but assuming it's a knife a knife can be used for many things it can be used for good things it can be used for bad things our director of the hospital is here and all the doctors use it for a very good thing which is to save patients so swami says same knife can be used to save a patient but the same knife can also be used for wrong doing so in this world how we how do we decide what is good what is bad the first thought that came to my mind was should it be based upon the constitution should the constitution of the country tell us this is good this is bad but to get into that it takes a long time and only when it's very clear and very structured it becomes a constitutional right or is it decided by the society collectively over a period of time society decides hey this is right for society this is not right for society or as in dharma vahini bhagwan says is it the intention oh my god but who knows the intention only i know the intention of my act nobody outside can know the intention of my act or is it based on outcomes because ultimately how is it going to impact when we talk of outcomes there are two types of outcomes one is impact on the society and the other is impact on the individual so to understand this concept of good or bad in a nice way in a clear way i have tried to build a structure to it so i'm going to build a matrix as you can see on one side is the individual the outcome may be good or the outcome may be bad on the other side is the society the outcome may be good or the outcome may be bad so we have four quadrants as they call it here the first quadrant as you can see below bad for the individual bad for the society needless to say let us not even talk about this here in this gathering these are to be completely avoided the other quadrant is good 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 for the individual good for the society obviously this is what we should be doing and there is no moral dilemma about this but where do we need to learn lessons from the ramayana is the other two quadrant this obviously is a tick what if it is good bad good for the individual but we know it is not good for the society should we take up such things what if it is bg bad or rather apparently bad for the individual but i know it's good for the society should we be doing this so in the next 10 minutes or so we'll try to delve on the two question marks because the other two are very clear one is a no no and one is a yes yes so let's start with one episode we can see ravana great person learned person bhagwan says the only thing he lacked was control over his senses unfortunately he got this thought of taking over mother sita in the short run ravana felt it is good perhaps he did not think about the society he did not think about the impact on the society so if you see where does ravana abducting mother sita come it comes in good for the individual ravana thought it's going to be good for him somehow he felt this urge he did not think of the society what will be the impact if you take away some other person's woman is it really correct tomorrow it could happen with you he did not think about this and what happened eventually was we all know the story ravana got destroyed lanka also got destroyed so what started as good bad apparently good for the individual he thought it is good for him but it was bad for the society it led to the other quadrant which is bad bad it became bad for ravana 
it also became bad for society for the whole world so one understanding we get from ramayana we'll see some more examples is what appears to be initially good for you but you very clearly know is good for the society is never be going to be good either for you or for the society let's look at the other side this is vibhishana the brother of ravana we all know initially he did not know really what to do mother sita was there in lanka he knew what ravana is doing is wrong he didn't know how to oppose him and one fine day he mustered all the courage he said brother i don't care i will leave you but i will go to rama it's nice to talk about as a story but suppose i have to do it in my house with my own elder brother it's not going to be easy so what vibhishana chose was apparently bad fighting against his own brother who was the king of lanka it would have led to so many negative outcomes so much of discomfort in the family in the palace in the kingdom so apparently bad for vibhishana as you can see bad individually so apparently bad for vibhishana but he felt it is good for the society he said ultimately i should side with dharma and not adharma and what happened eventually we know vibhishana was crowned as the king of lanka lanka flourished vibhishana also flourished so what started as bad for an individual but it was good for the society ultimately led to good good turned out to be good for the individual as well as the society so just to sum up what i said if you start with gb something which is you think is good for you in the short run but you know it's not good for the society all our scriptures tell us it's going to be bad for both but something which may be difficult for us i should not be corrupt i should not take the shortcut i should live a very sacred life all this may be apparently very difficult for us in the short run but all those things which are difficult for us in the short run but good for the society eventually always lands up as good for us good for the society swami calls this individual discrimination versus fundamental discrimination if you think think only from a individual point of view it is like ravana who abducted mother sita didn't think of society fundamental discrimination is a deeper discrimination good for the whole society that's what vibhishana thought about right and he won we will take up one more example in this module and wind up we can see mother kaikeyi such a great lady rama praises her so much rami rama swami praises her so much in ramkatha rasa vahini she loved rama perhaps more than mother kausalya loved rama but under the negative influence of one more instrument of rama which is mantra somehow her mind gets distorted her mind gets colored all of us would have gone through these experiences mind gets colored and one day she feels hey what about my son bharata how can rama become the king then what will happen to me what will be my status and in that influence what does she do she tells dasharatha send rama on exile did she think about ayodhya did she think about the world did she think about the benefit and the welfare of the citizens of ayodhya nothing she thought only about herself which is good for the individual but i think she also heart of heart knew it's not good for the society in the long run so it started with good bad good for the individual bad for the society what happened most important for a wife is her husband she lost dasharatha she became a widow the very purpose for which she did all this that bharata should become the king he came and refused bharata himself said mother i don't want this kingdom again she lost and rama went on exile we talk of lose lose this is lose 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 situation everywhere kai kai lost so good bad became again once more bad bad what is not good for the society and may be good for you will never work out in the long run mother sita you know she she we all know the story how she argued with rama saying i will come with you on exile she could have easily opted and 
you know, work from home option and stayed back happily in, in Ayodhya. But she argued with Lord Rama and undertook all those trials and tribulations in the forest, right? She was ready to go with Lord Rama on exile. Was it really good from an individual point of view? It was very difficult, very challenging. But Swami says that's it. If it is very challenging, very difficult, but if you feel it's good for the society, you should go for it. What happened when Lord Rama went for exile? He destroyed all the demons in the forest. He saved Lanka, gave it a great king, Vibhishana. He came back to Ayodhya and ruled as the king of Ayodhya. So here again we see what started with bad good, apparently bad for Rama or Sita turned out to be good for all of them. Win-win situation. Once again, reiterating the same fact, something which may be good for us in the short run, but we know is good for the society will never work out for both. It will become bad, bad. Something which may be apparently challenging for us, difficult for us, but it is good for society will always land up as good, good. This is what Swami says, short-term perspective versus long-term perspective. Always have a long-term perspective in life. I'll just quote this one shloka from Gita, which Bhagwan often quotes. That which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar. So Swami would say, Aim Kavali. You want poison now, nectar in the long run, or you want nectar for a few minutes and poison for the rest of your life. We have to make that choice. Ramayana helps us to make that choice. So, to sum up, that quadrant of bad, bad is a lose, lose situation. Let's never ever get into it. And obviously we wouldn't get into it because it's bad for the individual also. Good, good. If it's good for me, good for the society, please go ahead. Environmental protection, all that we talk about today is good for everybody. So we should go for it. If it is good, bad, as I said, it is a win lose situation, never go for it. Let's not go for prayers or short-term pleasures or short-term satisfaction, knowing very well that in the long term, neither will it be good for me, nor will it be good for the society. But the bad good is always a lose-win situation. Initially, it may be difficult, but in the long run, it will always be good for both. So lose-win situations, there are many examples in Ramayana. Let me quote two more and I'll close. Jatayu. To say Mother Sita, Jatayu jumped in. What is a bird in front of Ravana and his chariot, right? Jatayu didn't really have that great intelligence of how to fight, but Jatayu said, nothing doing, I have to say Mother Sita. Very, it was obviously in the short run, it was bad for Jatayu, but we know what happened. Swami says, that honor which Rama's own father could not get. Do you know what is that honor which Rama's own father could not get? To be in the lap of the son when he died. Rama could not feed his own father a drop of water, but he did that for Jatayu. What a great end Jatayu had. Right? So this is a lose win. Initially it may look like Jatayu lost. But till eternity, Jatayu won. Even today, Swami talks about Jatayu. Bharata chose the tough option of not ruling the kingdom. Now, how difficult it would have been. He could have happily ruled the kingdom. Because anyway, you know, there was no choice. Rama had left. He could have become a king, at least enjoyed those 14 years. He didn't do that. He kept Rama's padukas there. He struggled. He suffered. He lived like an ascetic. As challenging as it was for Rama, it was for Bharata. Right? It appears like he lost. But what happened towards the end? If you, have, if you would have read Ram Katara Savaini, Swami says when Rama was coming back to Ayodhya, people garlanded Bharata. Do you know why? They looked alike. Bharata was so lost in thinking about Rama, it is said that Bharata Rama looked like twins. They looked alike. People didn't know the difference. They went and garlanded Bharata. What a great honor Bharata got. This is another example of apparently losing initially, but winning eventually. Let me close this module. Swami says, Kashte 
fully a beautiful english version no pain no gain there's a beautiful uh, anecdote i would like to share a short story or rather a personal experience one of the interviews initially when you come to swami you really get very agitated because it's very tough to live swami's message so i remember i always had a castor oil face always scribbling in that interview swami said i don't remember the correct telugu words he said why are you like this i said swami is so difficult practicing your teachings this is the example swami gave he said take an orange sweet juice inside but to protect that sweet juice inside god has put a bitter skin outside only when you peel out the bitter skin slowly you will get the sweet juice inside so that day i understood life is also like a orange we have to slowly go through all challenges and eventually we will experience the sweet juice inside so recalling this message let us have the first bhajan and then i will continue with my second one shri ram jay ram jay jay ram jaan ki jeevan ram ki de 
So the main takeaway from the first module was Shreyas over prayers, long term perspective over short term perspective, do always what is good for the society. It will be good for us also. Coming to the next point, so once we start living a life like this and start choosing good over bad, we become eligible to surrender to the Lord. Ramayana again is a great text which teaches us about this very complex, complicated concept of surrender. What is surrender? The typical question that always comes in our mind is, is it belief in God's grace or is it belief in self-effort? Somewhere or the other we all get caught up. Should I leave this to Swami? Should I do it because it depends only on me? Should it be a combination of both? Or should I not bother about both? So once again to understand this, one more matrix for us. Pardon me because this helps us to understand it better. It gives it a structure. So on one side I have put belief in God's grace can be either low or can be very high. On the other hand, belief in self-effort can be very low or it can be high or somewhere between that. So once again we get four quadrants. Let's start with the bottom left. Someone who does not believe in the grace of God at all. Someone who does not believe in self-effort at all. What do we call him or her? Fool. <laughs> this is what Swami would say. Fool. Because you will be nowhere. Neither are we putting in self-effort nor have we faith in the grace of God. We will be nowhere. I don't think such an individual can reach anywhere. What about someone who puts in lot of self-effort but says, I don't believe in the grace of God. There are people. I mean, we don't know what they feel in their heart, but apparently they say, I don't believe in the grace of God. You know what? They are what we call arrogant people. If in heart of hearts they have faith, that's different. But if they don't have that faith at all in God and think self-effort can do everything, there are ample stories. We'll pick up some from Ramayana, which clearly shows that such people are arrogant. They may succeed, they may not succeed. That's a different issue, but they're arrogant. What if someone has tremendous faith in God and says, I will not do anything. This is something Swami has delved on a lot and he gives his example of potato chapati. He says, you are very hungry, you keep a plate of potato chapati in front of you and you say, I am hungry, potato chapati, I am hungry, potato chapati. Swami says, you will go nowhere, you will remain hungry. You have to take that and eat it. Clothes may dry in the sun. But you have to, you know, shake it and then hang it on the rope. These are examples Swami gives. So someone who says, God will take care of everything, I will do nothing, is Dunnapota. You know, that's what Swami would say. Lazy. Sheer laziness. So what is true surrender? This is true surrender. Do everything as though everything depends only on you. But pray in such a way as though everything depends only on God. So 100% faith in God, 100% faith in yourself. So 200%, that is real surrender. I hope that makes or gives little clarity about surrender. We will see one more way of understanding surrender. One more framework for understanding surrender. When we surrender, that is we put in all our self-effort, and we have total faith in God, should we have expectations? Somewhere in the mind, anything we do, I should get that gold medal, I should pass in this exam, I should be a successful man, I should win this contract, I should get a child. Somewhere, you know, expectations are there. So does surrender mean it's okay to have expectations or having acceptance? Whatever comes, let it come. Let anything happen. Let the roof fall down, I don't mind. I mean, can we think of a state like that? Let anything happen. So once again, expectation can be very low or very high. Acceptance, the two words are different. Acceptance is accepting everything that happens can be low, can be high. So once again, we have our 
four quadrant matrix. Let's start with the bottom left. Someone who has no expectations at all. Whatever comes, he doesn't even accept. See, if he has no expectations, then at least he should accept. Here, acceptance is also low, means he's a cribber. He keeps on cribbing, says he doesn't have expectations, but doesn't accept. Once again, such a person is a fool. Pardon the language, but that's the best word we can define these people by. What if someone has high acceptance, low expectation? I don't expect anything. Whatever comes, it's okay, it's okay. There is a little catch here. There is a positive side to it also, but there can be a negative side to it. And that's what typically Indians are blamed for. What do they call us? They say we are fatalists. We believe in fate. Na karma. I point this. Swami says, what karma? You should put in your effort. You can definitely do it. It's not that everything is already destined. Your effort can change your destiny. What you meet in life is destiny. How we meet it is self-effort. So that person is a fatalist. That is also not real surrender. What if someone has high expectations, very ambitious and is not ready to accept anything that he, you know, he doesn't want? No, this should not have happened. I, only this should have happened. Why Swami didn't give me this? They are obstinate. They are obstinate. They don't know where to bend their head down and where to really fight it out. And they get caught up in this obstinacy. True surrender is where you have all expectations. Swami never says don't have expectations. But you also have total acceptance. I have expectations. I want to get a gold medal in the exam. I'll study very well. But in case I don't get it, fine Swami, that's also good. I did my best. You felt maybe it is not okay for me. I didn't get it. I will still try again. That is real surrender. High level of expectations, high ambition, and high acceptance. Let me narrate three episodes of surrender, beautiful episodes that Swami talks about. One is about Lakshmana surrender. Swami writes, once in Panchavati, when they had just gone into Panchavati forest, they had to build a hut. So Rama calls Lakshmana and Rama says, Lakshmana, Please listen carefully. These are the words Swami uses. Swami says, Rama said, Lakshmana, find a suitable place and build a hut. Lakshmana started weeping, crying, sobbing uncontrollably. I'll give you a few seconds to guess why. Rama said a simple thing. Find a suitable place and build a hut. So even when I was reading Ram I was wondering what's the big deal? Why did Lakshmana start crying? Rama knew why Lakshmana was crying. And to let the world know why, Rama asked Lakshmana, Rama, why are you, I mean, Lakshmana, why are you crying? He should have said, Rama, you should have called me and told me, Lakshmana, ikra, build a hut. Why did you say, find a suitable place? He says, do I have a will other than your will? Do, know, do I know a place which is so suitable which you don't know? If you had just told me, Lakshmana, build a hut here, I would have been so happy. You left the decision making to me, find a suitable place. He said, Rama, I don't have a will of my own. See the high level of surrender that Lakshmana had. Nothing belongs to him. Swami, whatever you say. Swami, whatever you say. But that doesn't mean Lakshmana did not have expectations or was not ambitious. But at the same time, total acceptance to what Rama had in his mind. This is what Swami expects from us. Another classic example of surrender is King Janaka, the father of Mother Sita, whose guru was sage Yagnyavalka. Janaka had a very unique ambition. I don't think anybody in this world today may have that, but he had it. He wanted something like what we call instant food, instant coffee, instant He wanted instant moksha. Very funny, he told his uh, guru, Guruji, I want instant moksha. And how he defined was like this. He said, when I climb a horse, by the time I put my one leg on one stirrup on one side, and by the time I put my second leg on the other side, 
I should have got moksha. Great, no, even those days people were like this. <laughs> right? This is what it's there in the scriptures. The Guru was also equal, see, because King Janaka was not an ordinary. If you and I had asked, we would have asked Swami, Swami would have, you know, told us uh, Pichivada and all that, hysteria and all that. But King Janaka was of that stature. So Yagnavalka said, yes, I can give you. How? Surrender to me. He said, surrender your senses to me. Now imagine if Swami would have told us, surrender your senses to me, what we would have done? Over a period of time, gradually, over years, over decades, we would have thought how to surrender. You know what Janaka did? He was somewhere on the outer, uh, you know, Janakpuri ke bahar, in the outskirts, near a forest. He just collapsed there, sat in meditation, closed his eyes. Hours passed, a whole day passed. The queens in the palace got worried, why Janaka has not come back? They all went searching and they found he's sitting here like an ascetic, not moving, not responding to any call, not opening his eyes. And they were shocked. They said, what happened? What type of ailment is this? Why is he not responding? Everybody ran around hither, thither. Finally, they thought only the Guru can solve this problem. They went to Yajnavalka and they shared the story. Sir, this is what has happened. He said, don't worry. I'll solve the problem. He came. All these hours, everybody shouted, screamed. The wife also asked, Janaka, get up, get up. Nothing happened. Yajnavalka came and said, Janaka, he immediately got up. He asked Janaka, what is it? What are you doing? He said, you asked me to surrender my senses to you. If I have surrendered my senses to you, how can I use them without your permission? Look at the level of surrender Janaka had, right? Literally, yeah? not in spirit, literally. And Swami says he did get moksha. He said, climb up the horse. By the time he put his second leg, he was liberated. The third lesson which we learn from Ramayana, I mean, these all are so poignant and they, they are so profound, you know, they really move your heart. This is a very strange story. Once Rama was in the forest and there was a situation like this, Rama was standing and it so happened he stood on a frog. And Rama Ajana Bahu and this frog is so small. So naturally the frog got wounded and it, oh, it was struggling. Later on when Rama moved away, he saw this frog and he said, Are re Papam, why did you not call out to me? Frog is smart. It said, Rama, whenever I have any problem in life, I call out to you. Any problem. If you yourself give the problem, if you yourself give the problem, whom should I call out to? Rama said, you have to call out only to me, even if I am giving you the problem. So many times in life, we are very clear, Swami, you are creating this problem for me, but then the lesson is only one. Surrender to Swami, surrender to Swami. Whenever you are in doubt, surrender to Swami. So that is real surrender. I'll close this module with little epilogue to surrender. Swami talks about two approaches to surrender called the Marjara Nyaya and the Markata Nyaya, which translates as the cat approach and the monkey approach. If you would have seen how cats logistics, how they take their kitten from one place to another place, they hold this kitten in their mouth and the entire onus of protecting the kitten is only on the mother cat. Please observe. The kitten doesn't do anything. It is just hanging like that. The entire onus is on the mother or Swami to take care of the kitten. This is the Marjara approach or the cat approach. Have you seen what happens with monkeys? This is very common even when we go to forest areas. In monkey, it's the other way around. The child has to cling on to the mother as you can see here. The mother doesn't I'm not saying doesn't care, but mother keeps jumping from tree to tree. Hello, buddy, you better hold on to me. If you leave, you go. This is another approach. Swami says, both approaches are okay. Both approaches are okay. It is not digital in nature, just that among us, something will be more dominant. Either the cat approach where we say, Swami, you take care of everything. I just don't know anything. 
some of us are dominant in this the others are dominant saying swami give me the strength main karunga you know that sort of thing that approach is also okay so either become a baby in swami's hands and say swami i don't know anything take care of me or you hold on to swami's hand let's do a quick survey to find out which is more dominant in us only three questions are there and once you get an answer you know which is dominant in you first one before carrying out a very tough task for students it could be writing an exam which of the following prayer to god would you be more comfortable in making oh god please execute this task through me this is the cat approach the monkey approach is oh god please give me the strength to execute this task they may sound similar but you see there is a big difference between the two statements which one appeals to you before playing a match since many students are here i thought of putting this before playing a match which of the following prayer to god would you be more comfortable in making oh god please help my team win the match or god please help all my members of the team to play the match well cat or monkey when you're down with an ailment and admitted in the hospital which of the following prayer would you make oh god please cure me fast oh god give me the strength to go through this particular ailment a is the cat approach b is the monkey approach to sum it up swami says one is dasoham one is soham in dasoham we become so mild so meek so weak swami is okay with that and we say swami you alone can take care of me you become so puny so tiny that the bonds of chains of bondage and the world everything they just come out because you become so small that's what swami says the chains automatically fall off and you become free or soham i am swami swami is in me i have the strength i can do it you become so huge that the chains break either way we surrender to the lord so reflecting on this very sacred thought of surrender to swami let us now surrender to swami through a beautiful bhajan that our bhajan singers will sing and then we will move on to module 3 and the last one karuna samudra shri rama karuna samudra shri rama karuna samudra shri rama
the main takeaway from the second part of the presentation was true surrender is putting in all our efforts and still believing that everything can happen only with Bhagwan's will. The two go hand in hand. Also, nothing wrong in having expectations. We can have all the expectations. Otherwise, where is the motivation to work? But at the same time, have total acceptance that ultimately what happens is divine will and which is good for us. If we would have done these two, Shreyas over prayers, long-term perspective over short-term perspective, fundamental discrimination over individual discrimination, and then also practice surrender, then we reach a point where we can claim or we rather can pray that we become instrument of Bhagwan. Nimitta matram bhava sabya sachin. The most famous statement from the Gita where Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna, don't bother about all that's happening. It has to happen. You're just my instrument. Even for a moment, don't think you are doing something. I'm very sure elders seated here would have already experienced this in their lives and youngsters will slowly experience that it is so true. There are moments in life where Swami clearly shows us that everything which happens is by His will. One of the greatest instruments of Swami is our dear Hanumantudu. Swami says that's why He stands on the hill so tall in Prashantinilayam. Not that others are also great instruments, no doubt, but somehow all are great, but Hanuman is more great. <laughs> Swami always has a great affinity to Lord Hanuman. So, just spend a few minutes on this. Anyway, there's a separate talk one of the days on Lord Hanuman. Let me start with this beautiful statement that Hanuman makes in the kingdom of Lanka. When the first time he's captured, you can see this picture. And Ramana says, who are you? One of the best answers I've ever heard and Swami has narrated this in many discourses. I would have told the students so many times. One of the best answers I've ever heard is the one that Hanuman gave because he gave a holistic answer. What did he say? Deha buddhaya dasoham tava dasoham jiva buddhaya tava amshakaha atma buddhaya tvame vaha miti me nishchita mati hi. I'm very clear in my mind. What am I clear in my mind? At times when I think I am the body, because it's very difficult always to think I am not the body. Whenever I think I am the body, I am your servant Swami. Whenever I rise to a level where I associate myself with my mind, all my thoughts are your reflection. You are the one prompting these thoughts in my mind. And certain moments when I am singing a bhajan or sitting in trai or praying to Swami, suddenly I feel, Swami, I and you are one. That's when I merge in you, which happens every night when we sleep in Sushupti, we actually merge in Swami. Hanuman gave such a holistic answer. He said, I'm all the three. I think it applies to all of us. He was a combination, is a combination, I'm sorry, Hanuman is always there, is a combination of sharp intelligence and physical prowess. Rare instrument to have both of these and that's why we have this beautiful shloka on Hanuman. Buddhir, Balam, Buddhi, Intelligent, Balam, Strength, Yasho, Fame, Dhairyam, Courage, Nirbhayatvam, Fearless, Arogatam, Never fell sick, he never went to the hospital, Ajadyam, Ajadyam I think is Determination, Vakpatutvam, Very Witty, he gave perfect answers and anybody who meditates on Hanuman will achieve all these great qualities of Hanuman. I love to call this type of personality as H-type personality. Hanuman, we know we talk of so many personality traits. H-type personality is a great personality. As I said, he had both physical prowess and intelligence. So here is the last matrix for the evening, where on the bottom you have physical prowess low to high, and on the vertical axis you have intelligence low to high. There are instruments who are not strong, who are not even intelligent. They are the weak type instruments. Please, the right connotation is not to be taken in a negative sense. These are also great instruments of Swami. But it so happens they don't have physical strength nor they may have intelligence. Doesn't mean they are not instruments of Swami. We have the Masho type. Full, strong. Swami, come on, tell me what you want me to do. 
Do you want me to go and fight that guy? I've got all the strength to do. Swami says, most welcome. I need people like you also, macho type. You also have the intellectual type, brainy type, high intelligence. They may not be strong. Swami says, very good. I need you also. Swami needs everybody. In fact, all our instruments of Swami, remember in one interview, the all MBA students were there and typically those days, this was a cliche type prayer. Whenever we go to Swami, Swami, I want to be your instrument. Whether we really understand the essence of it, meaning of it was different. So that interview, we all started saying, Swami, I want to be an instrument. So Swami was a little, not very happy with that superficial prayer. Then Swami said, you are my instrument. And then I remember, we all were seated like this in a semicolor. Swami started pointing at each one. You are my instrument. You are my instrument. You are my instrument. You are my instrument. Finally, he turned his hand around and he said, this is also my instrument. Swami pointed to himself. He said, this is also my instrument. We were wondering, Swami, then who are you? So the body is also an instrument. There is a God beyond all this. And Swami was referring to his own body as an instrument. Hanuman type is the highest in intelligence and the highest in physical prowess. I'll take a few examples. This is very subjective. So this is no credibility to this. I just thought about it and put it. We could take Vibhishana in the initial days as a weak type. He was in Lanka. He did not know what to do. He was chanting Rama Rama but did not put in an effort to save Sita, did nothing. That's why Hanuman comes and tells him, Vibhishana, if you want to be close to Rama, fight or use your intelligence. And he did both later on. Right? He, he said, Ramana, I'm going and he surrendered to Rama. Jatayu was the physical prowess as I already talked about. You know, Jatayu fought so hard without even thinking whether I can win Ravana or not because that was not the motive was I should fight. Did not have the intelligence of how to escape. The squirrel was very intelligent. When all were building the bridge, the squirrel said, why don't I put a small stone? That also can help. Very intelligent. And the small stone did help. And we know how Rama blessed the squirrel. But above all is H type. Hanuman. We could think of some more examples. Maybe Shabari was the weak type, full of devotion. She was not a powerful lady. She was not a great, intelligent lady. But yet one of the greatest sung devotees, instruments of Bhagwan. Sugriva was known for his physical valor. Guha was known for intelligence. We all know the beautiful story when Rama came to cross Ganga. He said, oh Rama, wait, wait, wait. You kept your feet on Ahalya. And she became a woman. Today you will keep your feet in my boat. The boat will become a woman. Already have a big family. I can't take care of another lady. This was just a trick. So Rama knew. Rama smiled. He said, Guha, what's running in your mind? He said, let me wash your feet. Right? It was just an excuse. And then Guha was so intelligent, he got the opportunity to wash Rama's feet. The high type, H type is Anuman. So I surrender this presentation to Bhagwan. Let's hope we remember all these three great lessons from Ramayana. The first one being Shreyas over Prayas, long term over short term, fundamental discrimination over individual discrimination. The second one being the concept of surrender, where we have total faith in God, but also total faith in our own efforts. Small self-confidence and the capital self-confidence. Have expectations, but also have acceptance. And finally, pray that we become a good instrument of Swami in any one of those four quadrants. But we all would love to be like Hanuman. With these few words, I thank the organizers of this program for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And I also hope that we all got to learn something on this particular day one from the great sacred episodes of Ramayana written so beautifully in the Ramkatha Rasavahini. Sai Ram and thank you.
जानकी जय बोलो हनुमान की अयोध्यावासी राम 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 दशरथ नंदन राम अयोध्यावासी राम 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 दशरथ नंदन राम अयोध्यावासी राम 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 दशरथ नंदन राम पावन जान के जीवन सीता मोहन रा पावन जान के जीवन सीता मोहन रा पतित पावन जान के जीवन सीता मोहन रा Brothers and sisters, what a wonderful presentation it was. Did we hear stories about Ramayana? Did, we, uh, did he narrate the episodes? Perhaps yes. But along with that, a big chunk of message. Now that this is the difference which I was talking about in the evening today. The difference between the other Ramayanam and the Ramayanam of Ramakataraswahini written by Bhagwan. It is full of messages. And we need a person like Sri Rangarajan, sir, to bring out the essence with various examples so that youngsters, youth, why people of all the age group can imbibe that can practice their, these values in daily lives. A big round of applause once again to Sri Rangarajan sir. 
for a wonderful presentation a presentation which was outstanding in the sense that it was not the run of the type ramayana discourse on the ignorant significance of ramayana but scientifically ideally for youths he has brought the brought out the essence with three matrix now what are the three matrix one just to recap is about shreyas and preyas the important aspect of individual discrimination versus fundamental discrimination the second matrix or the concept was about surrender self effort versus god's grace and the third was about the aspect of nimitta matram or the instrument of divine the h type of personality as portrayed by rangarajan sir now tomorrow we will be having again sri rangarajan sir please clap for him we will have the pleasure of listening to mr rangarajan sir again sri rangarajan sir on the divine character of sri rama on the divine character of sri rama not only tomorrow but on all the days we will be sharing the insights of ramayana of course it will have a lot of episodes connected to it but with the emphasis on all the presentations until the 5th of april is on the insights of ramayana brothers and sisters there is a lot of takeaway messages from this ramayana saptaham I request all of you to come on all the days and be a witness to this ramayana saptaham i especially request both the director of brindavan campus i take this opportunity to even request the warden to please allow the students to come and benefit the messages of swami on ramayana now i have an announcement that tomorrow as i told you we will have the topic divine character of sri rama tomorrow's session again will start at 5 o'clock in the evening with vedam and bhajans and continue with the presentation of sri sri rangarajan and mangala aarti to swami may i now request sri sri rangarajan sir to offer aarti to bhagwan om jay jagadish hare swami satya sai hare bhakt jana sanrakshak bhakt jana